Jai Gauranti Thai, Gauranti Thai, Gauranti Thai, Jai Gauranti Thai. Hey, hey, Jai Ne Thai, Gauri Hari Hari Gau, Hari Gau, Hari Gau, Hari Gau, Nitai Gau. हे बाबा हो 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 कौति जनधी रे उहादे राहु भा हा हा उहादे हे घोरे जाल हा 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 माला हे घोरे जाल शिवा सुख हा 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 भई में गाज हा 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 हे भीमे हे हे भागा जीवी हो रहा देखे हे घुमार संभार जहाँ हे बाकी हे 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 बाजाया Hold her gun here, how do the case go? Hold her gun here, hey, my Hold her gun here, how do you kiss? Oh, 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 I heard thunder on it. It's a damn hunter. Hey, go, Hari 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 Hare Thai Hare 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 Sri Krishna Jai Chandra Prabhu Nitya Dhanya Sri Advaita Garadhar Shiva Sadi 
Nityananda Garadhar Shiva Sari Jai Sri Krishna Jai Sri Tanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Garadhar Shiva Sari Gura Vakt Vindhan Jai Tanya, Babu Nitya, Get it hard, her Babu Nityananda Shri Advaita Garadadhar Shiva Sahi He Ghura Bhakt Vindha Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare, 
ho 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 Krishna, <laughs> Hare 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 Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare Hare. Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna Krishna. Hum hum Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Hare Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Hare Ram. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hey 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 hey. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Hare, 
हरे हम हरे हम 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 हरे हरे हम गौर हंग हे गौर हंग हार के सारे सगे जग सारे हार हरे हम हरे हम 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 हरे हरे हम हार के सारे सगे जग सारे हार हरे हम हरे हम 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 हरे हरे ओ हो 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 हे हार के सारे सखिर के सारे हार हरे हम हरे हम 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 हरे हम हार के सारे सखिर के सारे हार हरे हम हरे हम 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 हरे 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 हम हरे हम हार गे सारे सगे जग सारे हारे हरे हम हरे हम हम रम हरे 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 हम हरे हार के सारे सगे जग सारे हारे हरे हम हरे हम राम राम हरे हरे हार के सहरे के सिर के सहरे हरे हरे हम हरे हम राम राम हरे हरे ओ हार के सहरे सके के सहरे हरे हरे हम हरे हम राम राम हरे हरे ओ हार के सारे सखे जग सारे हार हरे हम हरे हम 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 हरे हार के सारे सखे जग सारे हार हरे हम हरे हम 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 हरे हरे गौरंग 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 हार के सारे सखिर के सहारे हरे हरे हम हरे हम राम राम हरे हरे श्री हम हार के सारे गे सखे जग सारे हरे हरे हम हरे हम राम राम हरे हर हार के सारे सखिर के सहारे हरे हरे हम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे गौ रंग गौ रंग हार के सारे के सखिर के सहारे हरे हरे राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे हार के सहारे के सखिर के सहारे हरे हरे राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे हार के सहारे के सखे सखे सा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे हार के सहारे के सखे सखे सा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 के सहार के से किस के सा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 के सहार के से किस के सा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण हरे हरे राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 
ಆಶ್ರುತರಶತಿಮಾಧಿಸಿದ್ಧಾಂತಸ್ವಾಮಿಶ್ರೀಲಪ್ರಭುಪಾದಿಂದಿಸ್ಕೊಂಡರಾ
Hare Krishna, um, thank you everyone for coming to the kickoff of this weekend's seminar, Demons of Vrindavan, or Removing the Anartas. 
uh, led and facilitated by His Holiness Chandramoli Maharaj. Haribo! So, uh, thank you very much, Maharaj, for coming back to Chicago. Um, it always feels like ages, though you're so kind in giving us all your association. Um, so, just a brief rundown of tonight's schedule. So, the introduction part of this seminar will go until about 8 o'clock, although we're running a little behind, so plus or minus 10 minutes or so, uh, followed by Light Prasadam. Uh, we'll be served upstairs, Linda Mataji. Okay, more to develop on that. It'll, it'll most likely be upstairs. Um, also, just a brief intro to Chandramoli Maharaj. Um, so. uh, okay. Give me some water. Okay. So, uh, Chandramoli Maharaj used to be based in Chicago, um, though. Uh, the larger world at large within ISKCON called him, so uh, he's still kind enough to come back um, and spend time with all of us and give us his association. And uh, it was a nice introduction as well uh, to see him in Kirtan and dancing, where I remember even Chandra several Radha. years ago, uh, he could knock any of us on the dance floor with his energy. So thank you very much, uh, and I'll we'll turn it over to Maharaj. Documents here. Let's see, the other one is here. So, this is the other one. And I think you should have enough easily. If you run out, come back. Okay. One each. Uh, I mean, one, one each for everybody. Yes. Two cups. For what? Water? Water. Okay. Then my thermos is sitting in the desk area. Hare Krishna. So, and because we're running a little behind time, we'll go right into the class and uh, skip the kirtan. Okay. So, what you're receiving, these handouts, is a, one is a diagram of the four categories of an artist and the four subcategories within the four categories. And you can see how each of the categories are listed and what is the subcategory. And then the other is uh, Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur's uh, from Bhajana Rahasya. and explains that these four categories of an artist are verses in the Shastras describing them. And the results of these four anarthas and ultimately we'll speak about what they are and ultimately how to overcome them. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gena Jena Salakaya Chaksu Ummilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobistam Stapditam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swampadantikam Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasadu Yor Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Before we begin the seminar, Mother Vishaka, and she's sitting out in the lobby, she has a book table, and she is traveling around with the new film Hare Krishna, the mantra, the meaning, and the man who made it happen. And uh, they're raising money in order for the promotion of the film. And uh, it's a desperate need for Lakshmi at this point. So uh, she's offering two books, both authored by her. One is her life story in Krishna Consciousness, entitled 
five years and 11 months. And the other one is, okay. The other one is, um, I can't remember the title, but it's a beautiful book about the beautiful Saranagrati community in Canada, along with the, an analogy of nature and its relationship to verses in the Bhagavad Gita. Mother Rishaka is a great author. She's joined the Hare Krishna movement in 1967, when we were not even thought of, most of us at that time. <laughs> Um, so, and also, she's also offering a t-shirt, a beautiful t-shirt, and that describes a little bit about the movie. Um, and the two books are together, are going for a donation of $25, and the t-shirt is for $20. Very high quality t-shirt. So, before you leave, stop by the table and... Uh, See what happens. <laughs> okay. Of course, we would like everyone to give generously. So this seminar is mostly two seminars that I pushed into one because they, all, they overlap each other. And that is the demons of Vrindavan removing the Anarthas. Now, before we can understand more about this we have to understand a little bit about the process of bhakti and how bhakti works. Bhakti is a science. <laughs> and when you speak about science, you can speak about and making an experiment to bring about a particular result of that experiment. Now, what makes the experiment successful is two things. One, the ingredients that go into the experiment and the laboratory conditions that are favorable for bringing the results. So this point is very important to understand. The ingredients are the instructions of the spiritual master coming from Krishna based on the revealed scriptures and the laboratory conditions is our mood. What is our mood? The proper mood of bhakti. And what is that mood? The mood of bhakti is trying to please Krishna. All activities in bhakti are meant for the pleasure of Krishna, for Krishna, for Krishna's pleasure. So if the ingredients are not there, are there, but the mood is there, it may take a long time or it may never happen. If the mood is there and the ingredients are not there, then that's just sentiment. So Prabhupada said, philosophy without religion is mental speculation and religion without philosophy, philosophy is sentiment or fanaticism. Both. So, bhakti is a science, and we get our science from Srila Rupa Goswami. And Srila Rupa Goswami is our Abhideya Acharya. That is, he has received the entire science of how to execute bhakti, along with the different stages of how one progresses through up to the goal. What is the goal? Prema Pumarta Mahan, that is to love Krishna, or is to awaken our natural love for Krishna. That is the goal of bhakti. There's no second goal. All activities are devoted to receiving the mercy of Krishna, and that way we can serve Krishna, please Krishna, and ultimately develop, or not only develop, but really reveal our natural love for Krishna. To love Krishna is natural. Nitya Siddha, Krishna Prema Sado Kabunai, Sravanadi Siddhi Chitte, Kodiya Udai. This verse is from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spoke this verse. In the heart of all living entities, pure love for Krishna is there. It's just covered. Everyone loves Krishna. <laughs> Eternally, naturally, ecstatically. <laughs> to, to awaken that is the, the goal of the bhakti. 
And so Rupa Goswami, receiving this knowledge directly from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, has written it down in Upadeshamrita, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and also he's made, composed many verses and other books. And in one book, which is Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, he describes what are the nine stages of bhakti. Bhakti has nine steps, each one more progressive, coming closer to the goal of love of God. And it starts off with Adhaustrata faith. One develops some faith. Oh, what is this devotional service? What is this Krishna conscious activity? One becomes attracted just by having a little faith that let me learn more about God or the activities in relationship to God. So one, that stage naturally leads to the next stage, which is association, sadhu sangha, to come into the association of devotees. So in the association of devotees, we get a feel for the process of bhakti. And, and then we also get attracted to that process, and then we develop a fixed determination to follow the process. So we get a taste. It's nice. I like it. It feels good. <laughs> I'm feeling less miserable. I'm feeling more happy. In other words, and these people are nice. <laughs> so as we associate and serve and practice the process, that develops into a strong sense of wanting to make this one's life goal. And that leads to the third stage, which is called bhajana kriya. And bhajana kriya means to take shelter of Krishna's representative, the bona fide spiritual master. And then learn from the spiritual master, uh, serve the spiritual master, and then eventually come to the stage of becoming initiated. And as Srila Prabhupada said, initiation means, who knows, the next word. Initiation means beginning. So we're feeling to begin in the first two stages, we're getting a taste, and then initiation is actually the process of determined effort to become Krishna consciousness. So now we have everything's in place, the process, the spiritual master's guidance, and the association of Vaishnavas. But now we have to work through what is called an artist. <laughs> An artist, the word artha means auspicious or something desirable, something wonderful, something nice, something you, you want to have, artha. But then you put anar, anartha means the opposite, something undesirable, something that blocks our, what we say, our relationship with God. <laughs> so these anarthas are... The next stage, the next stage is called Anartha Nivritti. Under the guidance of the spiritual master and with the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and the association of devotees, gradually we learn what are the Anarthas and how to overcome them. Now, Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, I'm just giving a little overview right now, explains that when three-fourths of the Anarthas are destroyed. And you'll see there's a little chart here on the bottom of this one with the verses on it. Somehow I don't have one copy. Oh, yes, I do. Okay, I got one. You'll see that there are four categories of anarthas. The first category called bhakti. The second is sin and pious. And the third is aparad, which means offense. And you'll see, we mentioned the different stages, Shraddha, Sadhu, Sangha, Bhajana, Anartha, Nivritti. When three quarters of the Anarthas, one can move to the next stage, which is called Nishta. Nishta means I'm fixed. I'm determined, I'm fixed in the process of Krishna. I'm not deviated. As long as the Anarthas still remain within the heart, one cannot stay steady in the process of bhakti. One will go in and out, in and out. 
So then when one removes three quarters, then one becomes fixed. Once that fixation develops, then one comes to the next stage, which is called ruchi. Ruchi means sweet taste. Then one develops uh, Brahma Bhuta Prasannatma Nasochati Nakangshati Sama Sarveshu Bhuteshu Bad Bhakti Labhate Pradam. That means that one is joyful. There's no hankering for material gain, no lamenting for material loss. One is equal to everyone. One sees everyone as Krishna's part and parcel, the stage of Ruchi. When Ruchi, Ruchi becomes mature, it becomes a Shakti. A Shakti means deep and strong attachment for Krishna. One cannot, one cannot stop thinking of Krishna. And one is a, determined to serve Krishna 24 hours a day. From that stage comes Bhava. Bhava means deep and loving affection for Krishna. And when that stage becomes fully matured, it reaches the goal, which is Prema. And then in Prema, there's eight categories of love of God, up to the highest, which is called Maha Bhava, where one is exhibiting ecstatic symptoms constantly. So this is the process of bhakti. It's a great science. I'm just giving a little overview so you can get an idea what it is all about. Now, in order to get to the higher stages, we have to kick out those anarthas. <laughs> and I'll mention what the anarthas are. You have your chart here with the 16 anarthas. You can see that. And the first one, which is bhakti, is also called misconceptions. Misconceptions means I don't know who I am. I think I'm this body. <laughs> Or I think I'm something in relationship to this body. I'm American, I'm Polish, I'm Irish, I'm Italian, I'm who, I'm, I'm black, I'm white, I'm American, I'm young, I'm old, I'm educated, I'm not educated, I'm... Just give me, just put anything after I, and that's all false. It's all false. Why? Or we might say, to give a little concession, it's temporary. It's our identity in this world, which is temporary. Our real identity is that jivair sarupai krishnaya dichidas. We are pure soul, part and parcel of Krishna. That's who we are. So when we don't know, at least theoretically, who we are, that is called an anartha. I think I'm this body. <laughs> or I think I'm this mind. The mind is also part of the body. It's the subtle part of the body, but it's still related to the body. I am what I think, right? I am what I think. No, because your mind's always changing anyway. So which one are you? The one you were yesterday or today or tomorrow or how you feel in this moment or how you feel the next, which one is the real one? So these are just emotions and feelings which come to our association with this material energy. And they are constantly moving and changing. Something you are doesn't change. It only grows into realization of that identity. And that is, we're pure spirit soul. We also have emotions. We also have a mind. But that's a pure spiritual existence, not this temporary changing existence. So to understand who I am, or at least theoretically, I have a body and I also use the body for different things, but I know I'm not, this is not me. It's a covering, that's all. And if we get too much absorbed in the covering, we forget about who we actually are and then we act on the false platform and therefore we always struggle. We always struggle. Okay, so that's one of the misconceptions. The other one is not to know the identity of the Lord. And the Shastras, it teaches Krishna, uh, what is that verse? Ishvara Parma Krishna, Satchitananda Vigraha, Anadir Adir Govinda Sarvakarna Karnam. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is Sri Krishna, 
He is the cause of all causes. There's no second. He is the original Supreme Personality of Godhead. He has a transcendental form that is full of knowledge and bliss. And he is eternal. And everything that is in existence is coming from him. He is the original source. So when we know Krishna is the source of everything and he is the He's one without a second. Nityo nityanam chaitanas chaitananam eko bahuda vidadati kama. There's no one equal to, no one greater than the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is the absolute truth. He is the source of everything. He is the cause of all causes. He is the purpose of every activity. Everything works under his direction. When you know that, at least theoretically, then you know the identity of God. <laughs> So the scriptures, and, and you'll see, especially Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains who he is. He's telling him, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that. You can see me here, you can see me there. I'm the taste of water, I'm the light of the sun, I'm the syllable om, I'm the ability in all living beings. I am the source of everything, nothing happens without me. I am the seed-giving father of all living entities. Constantly, in Bhagavad Gita is always telling us who he is. And, what, and how everything is a reflection of his energy, either spiritual or material. So that knowledge is fundamental to our practice of Krishna consciousness, just to know the nature of the absolute truth. So, and because we, get, we know who we are, then we know we have an eternal relationship with God, which is never broken but only forgotten. It's only forgotten, it's never broken. You can't break that relationship, it's not possible, because it's you. <laughs> you can't be anything other than you. Sometimes even in the material world, we want to be somebody else, right? Oh, I want to be like that person. No, I'll tell you a little. Every position in the material world is, on, is taken. You can only be yourself. You can't be anyone else because everybody, every other position is already taken. <laughs> so we think of that in terms of our material identity. But in the spiritual world too, that identity is real and it's eternal. So that's who we are. So when we know, at least theoretically, who we are and who is God, then we destroy two of the anarthas of bhakti or misconceptions. The next one is another misconception you'll see is um, I mix in different philosophies with bhakti and I think they're also bhakti. In other words, not knowing the distinction between what is the process and philosophy that makes up bhakti as opposed to what may enter into bhakti and look like bhakti. <laughs> For instance, um, some, the idea that all souls are part of God and therefore all souls are godly, therefore all souls are God. Sounds logical. <laughs> no, you're right, it's not logical. All souls are part of God, a little fragmental energy of the absolute supreme source, but never the supreme source in itself. So there's a philosophy called Mayavad philosophy. Mayavad means they, they, because you are a pure spirit, you're also the supreme spirit. Like that. Or when Krishna comes to the material world, he takes on a material body and therefore he's just like one of us. And that's another, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, fools deride me when I come in my transcendental nature. They do not know my supreme dominion over all that be in my transcendental nature. So to somehow or other get confused and accept principles that are either material, philosophically different, or mayavad and mix it in with bhakti. So this, is, this takes a little bit of study, a little bit of hearing the philosophy to know what is, what is bhakti and what is not bhakti, or what looks like bhakti. 
And we'll talk about that in relationship to killing demons. Because sometimes the demons disguise themselves as devotees. When Krishna was in Vrindavan, one demon took the form of a cowherd boy and was associating with the other cowherd boys. And then no one could recognize that cowherd boy except Krishna, because Krishna knows everything. He could see, but no one else could see. So in the same way, it's sometimes it's very misleading, I guess the word is misleading, to somehow see things that are not, they're actually not bhakti. So we have to hear regularly from the teachers, from the scriptures, and from, in general, read the books to understand what is bhakti and what is not bhakti. Another conception is, I perform bhakti in order to increase my material life. I want a good job, I want a good husband, I want a good wife, I want more money, I want all these things that everyone is chasing after. I don't want to work hard from it, I just want to pray hard for it. <laughs> and I do a lot of puja to get it. Oh. Jaya Jagadi Sahare Swami Jaya Jagadi Come on Krishna You're rich even if you give me a million it doesn't it's not a big thing for you <laughs> So you know says and enters the, the, the mood of trying to bring in something material from the process of bhakti So that's uh a misconception or what we say a deviation in the, the execution of bhakti and the last one is to not know how sadhana bhakti works and how and how it leads to prema bhakti and again hearing from the scriptures hearing from the spiritual teachers learning the difference between what is material and what is spiritual and we'll speak about that in relationship to the demons because the demons, especially the ones we'll talk about in relationship to Vrindavan, they also present spiritual topics in a material way. They disguise their, their insidious nature by looking like the real thing. So we'll talk about that also. So these are the, these are the four misconceptions these all in the in the chart that you have there, it comes under the category of bhakti. Now you also see within your chart, you'll see these different um, stages: partial, uh, pervasive, complete, uh, almost complete, complete, and absolute. And what that means is that. When one anartha is destroyed, that is called partial. When many are destroyed, that is called pervasive. When almost all of them are destroyed, that's called almost complete. When all of them are destroyed, that is called complete. But then there's another stage beyond that, that even though you reach complete, they can come back. They can come back again. So that's the, the next stage is called absolute. So on the absolute stage, the anarta is gone and it never returns. So you see in the process of bhakti that on bhajana kriya stage, it's partial. And on nishta, it's complete. And on ruchi, it's absolutely gone. So that's the easiest ones to get rid of. <laughs> These are the easiest ones. Okay, so then we'll go to the next set, which is sin and pious activities. And then I'll mention them. Now, I've been a devotee in my last life, or I'm a good person in this life. I give in charity. I, I do a lot of welfare work for others. I keep a nice family. I don't commit any sins. I'm not... I don't harm anybody. I read the scriptures. I'm a very good person. That's called piety. Piety means punya. Punya means those activities that are morally accepted 
and bring about good material fortune. And what is that good material fortune? That I take a birth in a good family, pious family, I have good bodily features, I am intelligent, I can think clearly, I have a strong intelligence, and I also, what is the last one? I'm also materially well-to-do, good material opulences. I earn money really fast and easy. <laughs> in other words, because of one's pious activities, either in this life or in previous life, one gets good, good material situations. Now, what does that do? That allows one to get what he called material happiness. Also, when it develops even more, one can develop mystic power. And at the end of this life, one can go back to the heavenly planet, Swarga Loka, where life is 10,000 years compared to the 100 years on this planet, where longevity, good material situations, free from disease, wonderful. In other words, really, 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 really powerful sense gratification. <laughs> It's mentioned in the book. That's called Swargaloka, the higher planets. That's Indra's abode, like that. So you, one can achieve that, but the thing is, that's still in the material world. <laughs> that's still in the material world. And as long as one is still under the influence of the material, As long as one is still in the material world, then one cannot ultimately come to the stage of bhakti. So this piety, it's good. And it leads to good situations. What means that when I have these material things, I don't have to worry about them. Now I can devote my life to Krishna consciousness. The problem is now, I want the results of my piety. I want to go to heaven. I want to be a powerful mystic. I want good sense gratification. And I even want liberation. I even want liberation. So these are called anarthas. They're good, but they're only materially good. They're not spiritual. They're high material. Sometimes people think, oh, you know, why waste time worshiping God? I got everything material. Yeah, but you still have to die. You still have to grow old. You're going to get diseased. And you have to take birth again, which is not so nice. And so, and even then, no material situation is permanent. It can always change at any situation. Prabhupada used to say, even, even the rich man, he gets sick. <laughs> he has to suffer material anxieties. So even if one is materially well off, still, it's still within the realm of material energy. So here, these are called, these are called anarthas that come by way of pious activities. And you can see on the chart, that on Bhajana Kariya, they're almost complete. On Nishta, they're complete. And on Ashakti, when one becomes fully attached to Krishna, they're destroyed completely. Okay, now you'll see in the, the above part of this same page, you can see the stars that I marked there. The four verses that describe these four categories of anartha and so the we went we went through the first one which is um, uh, bhakti and then the second one which is pious activities so that's the second one down and the third one down now i'll go back to number one which is the first one in the list of verses and these are what we call sinful activities. 
Now there's four categories of sinful activities, which is called one, weakness of heart. I'm sorry, no, that's wrong. Let me see, where, where am I here? Um, okay, uh, four kinds of attachment to objects not related to Krishna. That's the last one. Deceitfulness or fault finding enviousness and the desire for material fame. So these are sinful because they're against the process of bhakti and they're also immoral. <laughs> so attachment to objects not related to Krishna. I chant Hare Krishna but I get high on LSD. And it's really nice. I can really chant nicely there. Krishna killed one demon, and that demon represents that you can get your bliss higher from bhakti by taking intoxicants. <laughs> the natural state of the living entity's relationship with Krishna doesn't need any artificial inducement. That comes just the process of bhakti will elevate the consciousness to the higher stage. When Prabhupada was here in the beginning, what was he dealing with? He was dealing with all drug addicts, right? People were taking LSD and all kinds of, you know, kinds of intoxicants and illicit sex and everything. And, and he became popular amongst that group of people. And so those people were really attracted to Prabhupada. And when Prabhupada started to bring the Hare Krishna mantra in, people were chanting and dancing and feeling the ecstasy of Krishna consciousness through Harinam. And so one article came, chant Hare Krishna, stay high forever, never come down. <laughs> the highest form of intoxication, the Hare Krishna mantra. <laughs> Really, it'll take you so high that you have to, you won't even know where you are. <laughs> the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is Krishna in sound, and Krishna, that's the absolute principle. Anandam Buddhi Vardhanam, it's full of material, ha spiritual happiness. It's not, it doesn't have a trace of material happiness. And so one can get attached to things in this world that are against the process of bhakti. I just mentioned one intoxicants. Another one is deceitfulness or fault finding. Presenting oneself in a certain way and trying to, but actually has another motive. I've come to bhakti, but I really come here to get a powerful position so I can control other people. Or I wanna make a lot of money, so that's why. In other words, deceit, deceit, what does deceit mean? What would be a good definition of deceit? Somebody. Trickery, yeah. You're trying to present something that you're hiding from others and you present yourself as something different. Or you use very certain language. Uh, my dear sir, you're very nice, you're very kind, you're very generous, I'm very poor, give me some money. And flattery, and that comes by way of deceit. Like that. So, deceitfulness and fault finding. To find fault with others is an anartha. People have faults. People have good qualities. So what do you do? When you see a fault, what do you do? Do you dwell on it or do you broadcast it? No. A devotee doesn't see a fault in another. And if he does see a fault or she sees a fault, he just pushes it aside. It's not so important. People have good qualities. People have faults. So we see if we, when we see faults, then we see the good qualities. You can't sometimes overlook the fact that there is a fault. But at the same time, if you dwell on it and you make it your business to broadcast it or you become disturbed by it, then that, that becomes an element of an art that, that blocks your Krishna consciousness. So, 
Therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said something very, very powerful. He said, if you want to get my mercy, or he said it in a different way, he said, I give my full mercy to everyone who chants the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and does not find fault with others. <laughs> does not find fault with others. So that's something we have to work on. Try to see the good in everyone. Everyone is good, but there may be something else. So push that aside. So don't find fault, don't broadcast faults. And the last, the other one is enviousness. What is envy? Hmm, wow. We're going to speak about one demon tonight who is a personification of envy. His name is Kaliya. I'll tell the story of Krishna killing, not killing, he didn't kill Kaliya, but he chastised him in such a way that he, all his envy was destroyed. And this envy is the cause of us coming to the material world. It starts with enviousness of Krishna. Ah, Krishna is the supreme enjoyer. Krishna is the supreme controller. Hey, man, I want that position too. But, you know, Krishna can do his thing, but I want my territory too. <laughs> no. <laughs> now, the idea, envy means um, I'm unhappy because you have something that I want. Or you're getting some attention and I want that attention. You're getting some position, I want that to position. So this enviousness is, it's, it goes pretty much deep. And that's why there's so many problems in the world. It's all based on envy. One nation is envious of another nation. The United States wants the oil in the Middle East, so they're envious of those people. They want to destroy them and get the oil. So. That's a form that comes out in a form of war. So envy. Now I'll tell you a little definition of envy. If you hear this definition, you'll never be envious anymore. <laughs> you ready? You're all listening, I hope. Okay. Now we understand one thing, and this is this we understand that whatever a person has, or ever whatever a person is is somehow given by God. God has allowed that person to be something or have something, either through the material energy or the spiritual. And therefore, God is sanctioning that. So therefore, I don't like what God has given to another person or what he's not given with me. Therefore, my problem is not with the other person, it's with God. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's, he's up there, but he blows it. He makes some mistakes sometimes. He's letting that person get all, of, all the attention. What about me? Come on, Krishna, get it right. Don't you know I sent my prayers in the other day and I gave you $108 with it. So the point is that our issue of enviousness comes back to the Supreme Lord because he is allowing... He's not necessarily, not necessarily, he's sanctioning it. It doesn't mean he wants it to happen, but that's the way his energy works. He allows things to happen. So because he's allowing things to happen, he is the source of whatever's happening in this world. So when we're, we don't like that for whatever reason, because of our own situation, that is called envy like that. And Prabhupada said, killing animals. That's also envious. That animal has a right to life. I destroy that right. That's, I'm envious of that animal's right to exist. So violence is a form of envy. It's a very extreme form of envy. Like that. Okay, and so, and the last one, and this is the hardest one to get rid of, desire for fame. It's called pratishta. Pratishta means that I want to be honored, I want to be respected, I want to be, I want to be. And people will do anything somehow to find some kind of position 
where they develop some influence, some power, some control, some adoration, like that. So, and therefore, why do I do that? Because I want to feel important. Just like sometimes we understand that people are very much after money, but even those who have a lot of money, it's not so much the money they want, it's the power that they get from having that money, the position, the followers, the adoration. When people speak, uh, when, I, when I speak, people listen, it's a sense of uh, exhilaration, happiness, power, feeling of importance like that. And then when that gets, gets on, and when people can't find that, then they'll do something to do that. They'll find something. Prabhupada said they'll even get a dog so the dog pays attention to them. Somebody has to pay attention to me. Nobody else would, so at least I'll get a dog. So, some, some situation where I get some, what we say, adoration, distinction, profit, recognition, like that. If it comes naturally, that is not pratishta. But if you seek it, that is pratishta. It can come naturally by Krishna's arrangement. People get that, and that's not wrong to have it, but when, when you want it in order to enjoy from that, that is called pratishta or desire for fame. And Bhakti Siddhanta really gives a really, uh, I guess what, we, what would I say, a real nitty gritty definition of pratishta. He says, pratishta, the desire for material fame is like the stool of a boar. Now, what is a boar? A boar is a pig, right? It's a wild pig. It runs in the jungle, very fierce. So what do boars eat? Stool. And so what is the, what is the stool of a boar? It's recycled stool. Stool twice over. So that's pratishta. <laughs> According to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, so he gets right to the point. So, the, 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 what, how do you get rid of that desire? Glorify the devotees, glorify the Lord. We want to make the Lord famous. The word kirtan comes from the word kirti. The word kirti means, who knows? Fame. Kirti means fame. So when you're doing kirtan, you're spreading the fame of the all-famous Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's the word, that's what kirtan means. You're glorifying that person who is famous, spreading his fame through chanting his holy name. But it has a second meaning. That means those who do, do kirtan also become famous <laughs> because they're connected with the all-fame Supreme Personality of Godhead, like that. So that's the actual definition of the word kirtan. Pretty interesting, like that. So the devotees want to glorify the Lord. They want to serve the Lord. They want to serve the Vaishnavas. They want to glorify other Vaishnavas. They want to glorify the Lord. They want to glorify the, the pure devotees of the Lord. And this frees us from this personal desire for profit, adoration, distinction, which ultimately leads to more and more sense gratification and other forms also. And we'll talk about that. So that's the last of the sinful activities. Now, the last one is aparad. You can see that one here, the last category. And you'll see this one seems to be the most severe category to, to remove. On Bhajana Kriya, it's uh, partial. On Nishta, it's pervasive. On Bhava, all the way up to the Bhava platform, it's almost complete. On Prema, love of God is complete. But only when one sees Krishna face to face can one be freed from the tendency to commit offenses. Wow, that's pretty heavy. <laughs> so what does that say? 
that actually one has to be careful not to commit offenses. And then we see there's one verse. Um, which one is it? It's the one on the second column on the right, Krishna Nam Sarupesha Tadiya Chit Cha Ye Gyeya Buddha Guna Nityam Aparadas Chatur Vidha. Offenses towards the name, offenses towards the form of the Lord, offenses towards the devotees of the Lord, and offenses towards all living other living entities are the four kinds of offenses. So this is, these are, these we have to carefully avoid. And then we recite the 10 offenses to the holy name every day. The offenses to the form of the Lord means the offenses in deity worship and temple activities. Offenses towards the Vaishnavas. There's six ways to offend a Vaishnava. And offenses to other living ent entities also who are part and parcel of Krishna. So these are the four types of fences. I could explain a little bit about each of them, but that would take such a long time. I'm just going to list them. So, but uh, very carefully try to avoid offenses towards the Vaishnavas. That's the most severe form of offense. So how do we avoid that? By serving Vaishnavas. If we don't, now listen to this, if we don't actively try to serve the Vaishnavas, we will commit offenses against the Vaishnava. You might say, I don't, I don't commit offenses. You do unless you serve Vaishnavas. You have to serve Vaishnavas. Because Vaishnav seva is higher than serving Krishna. If you, want to, if you want to go to the highest platform, Krishna says, he who says he's my devotee is not my devotee, but who, who serves he who says he's a devotee of my devotee is actually my devotee. That's from the Adi Purana. So one wants to get the favor of the Lord, they actively try to serve the Vaishnavas. We think of ways to how to serve Vaishnavas. Giving gifts to Vaishnavas, being friendly to Vaishnavas, taking an interest in Vaishnavas and trying to help them. Just associating with Vaishnava and inspiring them in Krishna consciousness, doing our service, cooking for the Vaishnavas, cleaning the temple. In other words, with that mentality in mind, I want to serve the Lord by serving the Lord's devotees. This is the highest form of service. And Krishna says that also. He acknowledges that. So by serving Vaishnavas, we can free ourselves from the tendency to commit offenses to the Vaishnava. We might say, well, I say, I just serve my spiritual master and I serve the Lord, that's all. I don't serve anybody else. No, that means you'll never make progress and you'll always commit offenses because of the Vaishnavas. You have to begin serving Vaishnavas. You have to think of ways to serve the Vaishnavas. And in that way, you'll develop love for the Vaishnavas and that love extends to your love for Krishna. Because when you love the Vaishnavas, it's actually because they're part of Krishna and Krishna's love is available. So that's, that's important to understand that. So therefore, one should very carefully avoid fences to the Vaishnavas and other living entities too. Sometimes we think, oh, that person's not a devotee, he's just a rotten karmi, we don't care. No, that person has Krishna in their heart. They may not be performing devotional service, but still they're very dear to Krishna. Krishna, Krishna is equally disposed to all living beings. He doesn't love one living entity more than another. And as a, as a perfect father loves all the children, even the children who are slow and unintelligent, and even with the children that are intelligent and very, what we say, capable, the father loves all the children equally. Therefore, Krishna loves every living entity equally. But he shows favor to those who serve him. But his love is equal. He even loves the demons, too. He loves them so much, he kills them. And that gets rid of their demon, demoniac mentality, purifies them, and then they ultimately get liberation. So that's his, so Krishna deals with every living entity in a loving way. But that love will be manifested in different ways. 
don't try to copy Krishna and kill the demons because that'll be a problem. <laughs> so um, it could be a, you might wind up with a, a little bit of a jail sentence. <laughs> So, but the point is that, yeah, therefore one should, what is that verse? Vid, vidya vinaya sampane, bravani gavi hastini, suni chaiva svapake cha, pandita samadarshana. Krishna, Krishna says, one who sees a Brahmin, a cow, a dog, no, a cow, a elephant, a dog, a dog eater, with equal vision, samadarsha. Samadar, sama means equal, darsha means to see. Pandita, he's a great soul. In other words, one who sees in the heart of every living being, Krishna is there. Krishna is in the heart of every living being. So we should try to see like that. We should try to see that everyone is part and parcel of Krishna. And therefore, everyone is worthy of respect in different ways, of course. And there, also within the heart of that person, even though they're non-devotees, Krishna is there also. So in the heart of every living being, there's two souls. There's God and that living entity. So therefore, one does not cause any unnecessary difficulties to any living entity knowing that in the heart is Krishna, like that. Prabhupada says, even unnecessarily killing insects, devotee is so careful that they want to avoid even killing uh, insects because they know that in the heart Krishna is there of that living entity. Wherever there's life, there's a soul, and whatever there's a soul, there's God. God is there. So, therefore, we should try to avoid offenses. And then you might question, wow. In other words, even on that platform of prema, how can one commit offenses? Well, we have the example of Jai and Vijay in the spiritual world. They committed offenses to the four Kumaras. And they had to fall to the material world. So... We know that story from the Bhagavatam. Um, I'll give you another story. There's a, there's a one, there was a very wonderful Vaishnavi. Her name was Krishna, Krishna Priya. And she was attached to chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. She could not stop. She was on a very high platform of love of God. She would chant always. And there was a great soul. His name was Rupa. Upakaviraj, he was a great soul also, and he was an orator of Bhagavatam. He would go and give wonderful Bhagavatam dissertations. And he was very elevated too. He was on the Bhava platform. So one day he was giving a lecture and Krishna Priya came to his class and she sat there and she was chanting Japa while he was talking. Now, <laughs> He became a little unhappy, disturbed, and he said, he turned his attention to her and said, Oh, are you listening? Are you chanting? How can you chant and also listen? She didn't say anything. She remained quiet and she continued to chant. <laughs> Why? Because she was, a she was absorbed in the holy name. He became angry and started to speak speak very harshly towards her. She remained humble and didn't respond. And then after the class, he became very angry. And then after some time, his material desires started to come back again. It says that when you are very high enough platform, you commit offenses. What happens, Your those material desires that you left behind again start to come back. And that's what happened. And then he, he fell down because he committed an offense to this saintly lady. He committed an offense to her. So he was on a high platform. So unless one 
is on the highest, highest platform, seeing Krishna face to face, possibility, not the likelihood, it's not likely, but it's the possibility that one can commit an offense. So this is what this, what Dakar is giving us, this chart, showing that until one actually is fixed at the lotus feet of the Lord in love of God, the tend not the tendency, the possibility of committing offenses is still, poss still possible. It's still there. So out of all the forms of anarthas, aparads are the most difficult to overcome. But if one practices this one verse from, Chait from Lord Chaitanya Shikshastaka, Trinadapi Suni Chena Tayor Iva Sahishnuna Amaninam Amanadenam Kirtaniya Sadarahi. One will never commit offenses. Pra this verse is fundamental to the execution of successful devotional service. Practicing humility, tolerance, respect for others, and not asking any respect for oneself. So that's something that is, that's a cultivation of the mood of bhakti, which allows bhakti to grow more and more like that. In that mood, one makes fast advancement. Not just advancement, fast advancement. One can go through the stages very fast when one cultivates this mood of bhakti. So Lord Chaitanya, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami speaks about this in Chaitanya Charitamrita. He says, that this verse is your ornament. Wear it as your ornament and string it on the necklace of the love of God. And so this is what a devotee wants to practice, these, these four principles. We practice it. Perfection comes by practice. Perfection comes by chanting the holy names of the Lord and cultivating these moods of bhakti like that. And then one is very unlikely to commit offenses. And even if there is a little offense, it's not so bad. Then one can move forward. Okay, so I hope I didn't scare anybody. All of a sudden, you're all thinking, maybe I'm in the wrong movement. No. <laughs> it's not that bad. <laughs> it's actually quite nice. So, but, and then, of course, now here we go. Now, Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, these anarthas we went, lead to the six enemies. You can read it on your sheet. Kama, Krodha, Loba, Moha, Madha, Madha and Matsarya. Lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, and envy. These anarthas also beget six waves. And what are those waves? Distress, illusion, hunger, thirst, old age and death. So from the anarthas comes the enemies, from the enemies comes the waves. But then here's the good news. Okay, everyone's waiting for the good news. Here we go. All anarthas, however, go far away by the performance of Nam Sankirtan. <laughs> so one who becomes attached to chanting Nam Sankirtan not just japa, or not just kirtan, but both, One then one can dispel the tendency to commit an artist. And then these narthas just go. The power of the holy name can destroy the tendency to commit offenses and destroy those tendencies for material desires, previous karmic activities, which can, which can cause sinful tendencies, and ultimately awaken vidya, vidhu, jivana, that the knowledge of the shastras become revealed through the chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Ram. Goloka Prema Dan Hare Nam, Sankirtan. This is the gift, not only a gift, it's not a, it's not a small thing. It is the bright light in this dark age of Kali, internally, externally. So one should be eager to chant, eager to 
what we say here, the kirtans of the holy name, take part in the kirtans, take part in japa, then gradually one will purify the tendency for all these anarthas. So, but when you're in kirtan, you should know you're in the spiritual world. <laughs> right? We just had kirtan, right? It was nice. We're all dancing and chanting. No one's thinking about, you know, prashad, right? <laughs> Everyone's dan chanting, dancing. You forgot about, you know, Donald Trump. You, everybody's just chanting and dancing. It becomes an absorption. This is the holy name. It forces you into that energy if you somehow, and when you enthusiastically take part, then your consciousness immediately is lifted up. Your enthusiasm brings about fast results. Okay, so these are the, any questions before I go into the first demon? I'll speak about one demon. How much time do we have? We only have 15 minutes left. Wow. We can skip the question. Huh? Oh, I had a question, but we can skip okay. save it if you want to. Yeah. 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 Question? Yeah. I, had a, oh, I just had a quick question about the story you shared about um, the devotee that was speaking that was disturbed by the, the ladies Kriya. chanting. Yeah. yeah. Um, would she have also incurred some kind of reaction as well because she was, I guess, performing an action that was... No, she wanted to, she was listening to the lecture. She was absorbed. She could hear the, everything he said, but at the same time, she could not stop chanting. So this is also a point to understand that when you're chanting the holy names nicely, your attention doesn't become decreased to other things. And chanting broadens one's consciousness. And she's absorbed in that chanting. And she's also hearing the lecture. But he couldn't understand that. She, he was thinking that she was causing a disturbance in his class. And he wanted attention. He wanted full attention. She was giving him attention. But when she was challenged, because of her natural humility, she didn't try to defend herself. She wouldn't say, oh, wait a minute, well, you know, you, you got it wrong, Prabhu. No, she just kept chanting. She was humble. But he got angry. To, to question her wasn't the offense. When he got angry at her, that was the offense. If he questioned her, and then that was fine, but then he became angry because he felt, yeah, he, she wasn't listening, but she was. <laughs> Rupa Kaviraj, that story is floating around. You can hear it. Yeah, it's interesting. Any other questions? Yes, Subal Prabhu. I don't know if I missed this because I have to go out a little bit what you were speaking. But in the chart that you gave from the Madhurya Kandambini, um, in the apparat column, uh, the Anartha Nivriti, no, let me see, Nishta, it says that it's pervasive. And mm -hmm. in the Kriya it's partial. It seems, at least by, by the use of words, pervasive means that it's... Many. Many. Mm -hmm. Partial means that it's, it's less... One. Know. One. If you can explain... Partial, it. it's interpreted that partial means one, pervasive means many. So even in even the Vajana complete, Kriya, there's still something left there. Uh, so it seems that Vajana Kriya, we're like many of us are, you know, coming to that stage or, or in that stage. And it seems that the offenses are actually pervasive. That's how we experience it, at least myself, I say. No, it's interpreted differently. Uh, it's understood differently. Pervasive means uh, many, 
Many types of apparatus are being destroyed. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I understand now. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And partial means just a few. I see. I mm -hmm. understand. Thank you. That's how it's explained in in the Shastras. You can find that in Chaitanya Charitamrita, and there's an explanation of these five stages. Which one is the one that is destroyed in the in the Vajana Kriya, or the one, the partial ones that are destroyed? What type of offense? Uh. <clears throat> um, that's not indicated. Uh. I never I never read anything. It could be. It doesn't necessarily have to be a particular type of offense. It could be a different, and many, many of the different kinds of offenses. It could be the, I would, to use philosophical speculation, I would think it would be the, the offenses against the, the form of the Lord, which seem to be the least of the offenses. Offenses to the holy name are greater, and offenses to other living entities and and the Vaishnavas are even greater offenses. Offenses to the form of the Lord is we don't really know how to, you know, we, we make mistakes in duty worship, we make offenses on the altar, we make offenses in the temple. That's mentioned in nectar devotion. Like if you get angry at a devotee in the temple, if you speak loudly before the deities, if you turn your back to the deities, these are offenses. If you sit with your legs like this, that's an offense in front of the deities. So there's different ways to perform offenses to the form of the Lord. To think of the form of the Lord as material, mm -hmm. Offenses to the name are a little stronger. Mm -hmm. The 10 offenses plus the 11th. And offenses of the Vaishnavas are the most severe because they cannot be destroyed simply by, you can get rid of the reactions of the offenses to the form of the name, to the form and the name simply by chanting the name. So if you commit an offenses, you can just over, what we say, you can destroy those offenses by chanting, by what we say, continuous chanting, and you can destroy those. But not for Vaishnavas, even, in, even the holy name cannot save you from that. That you have to do on a personal level. It's the most severe form of offense. Yeah, we read in Chaitanya Charitamrita how Shivas Thakur was offended by Gopal Chapala, how Haridas Thakur was offended by Gopal Chakravarti, like that. There's many kinds. How, you know, uh, what's his name? Tarasa Muni, yeah. yeah. Jai Haribo, Jai. Shankar Pandaji. Hare Krishna, my obeisances. Sanka, yeah, that's that's the that's that's one of the most outstanding messages in the Bhagavatam. That particular pastime. That Durvas, a powerful sage, powerful. I mean, he's an expansion of Lord Shiva. He has mystic power. He even knows past, present, and future. But at the same time. Because he somehow misunderstood a Vaishnava and found fault with that Vaishnava. He got implicated. And even he was so powerful, he could actually go to Vaikuntha and fall at the feet of Lord Narayan and beg forgiveness. The Lord said, I'm helpless, I can't save you. <laughs> And he quoted that famous verse, the pure devotees are in my heart and I'm in the heart of my pure devotees. My pure devotees know no one but me and I know no one but my devotees. So the Lord said, my hands are tied. If you want to free yourself from this offense, you have to go to Ambarishas. And if he forgives you, you can get my mercy. So that's how much 
the Lord is captured by the love of his devotee. That's why when one offends a devotee, it's actually, it actually hurts the Lord also. Now, you're a devotee, and you offend another devotee, so the Lord is understanding, okay, but still there is a process for relieving that offense. And the process is too, one has to beg forgiveness and one has to offer oneself a service. What service can I do for you? Not just beg forgiveness and say, hmm, I'm afraid of getting smashed, so please forgive me. <laughs> That's not the program. The idea is when you cause someone some distress, there should be some remorse for that. And not because, well, I cause you distress. I don't really care, but I'm really worried about getting kicked because of it. That's not really forgiveness. That's why Krishna didn't forgive Indra right away. When Indra was begging forgiveness to, for Krishna after trying to kill his residents by pouring all that rain into Vrindavan. Krishna didn't even pay attention to him at first. Oh yeah. Because Indra was just thinking about his own, you know, neck. He was only when he finally came to the point of really seriously feeling that, oh, I caused so much distress. I'm really, from the, his heart, he was really remorseful. And then Krishna listened to his prayers. Before then, Krishna had no time for him. <laughs> so that's part of the forgiveness process. <laughs> and then the other thing is to offer service. What can I do? So. But therefore, devotees, it's easy not to commit offenses if you do one thing. Just, just always see that every devotee is very important. And if you try to enjoy, you'll commit offenses. If you try to serve, you'll never commit offenses. When we're in the, we're in the enjoying mood and somebody else is in the enjoying mood, then boom, somehow there could be some friction. I'm enjoying and you're enjoying and we somehow our enjoyment don't work together. <laughs> we clash. But when we're in a mood of service, then it's different. Then you can't commit offenses. <laughs> well, that's Vaishnava culture. So when we dance, we dance to serve the Lord, to inspire the devotees. When we manage, we manage to please the Lord and, and keep Krishna's temple going nicely. We do it as a service, not think, well, I'm a manager, hmm, I got an office, I got a name, hmm, I'll even get a gold plaque, and maybe I'll get a gold watch after 50 years of managing. <laughs> Something like that. You know, you know, you know, he was looking for the gratuitous part of the program. So that's not, and you're not like that, I'm just, just using this an analogy. So the point is, that we do it as a service. And the thing is, bhakti is so nice that the service itself is satisfying. This is the point. If we're just serving for the sake of service, we can find happiness in the service and not in the results. Krishna brings the results. We can't make the results happen. But we can be inspired for the service. <laughs> Okay. Should I tell a demon story? Is it too late? I don't want to go. I don't want to break any rules. No. <laughs> I might get smashed. <laughs> Should I tell a story? Yeah, because actually, all right. So, this is Kalia represents brutal cruelty maliciousness, pride, envy, and a snake-like crookedness. 
He particularly tries to pour his poison into the hearts of innocent Vaishnavas, which Krishna cannot tolerate. And so the Lord destroys him. According to Garga Samhita in his last life, during the Manvantara of Swabhubhuva Manu, he was a, na a sage named Vedasira, who was cursed for now allowing another sage, Ashvasira, to meditate in his ashram. You are angry for no reason. You hiss like a snake, become a snake. Then Lord Vishnu appeared and told him that he would place his lotus feet on his head in that lifetime. So Veda Sira took birth as a daughter from the, from the daughter of Daksha called Kadru Jai Shishi Kishori Kishori Ki Jai. So Krishna was in Vrindavan and there was a lake called the Kaliya Lake which was part of the Jamuna and there was one snake that was living in that lake it's called Kaliya. Kaliya was kicked out of the ocean by Garuda and he ran to Vrindavan to take to get free from Garuda and so he made his residence there. He was a multi-headed serpent. So one day, Krishna and the cowherd boys, they came to the banks of the Jamuna River and the cowherd boys were thirsty. And they say, oh, look at the Jamuna. It is so nice and its waters are so thirst quenching. So all the cowherd boys started to drink the water. But after some time, they felt really bad. And then all of a sudden, they all collapsed. And then it was understood they died. Krishna saw that and he glanced over his friends and they all came back to life. And they realized Krishna brought us back to life. We died. Why did they die? The whole area was polluted, all the waters, by this one serpent called Kaliya. And his venom was so strong that even when birds would fly over the lake, the fumes from the poison would rise up and the birds would fall dead. All the trees on the banks of the Jamuna were destroyed, except one. Krishna decided that he was gonna do something. So he decided to have some fun. And so he went on one tree and he got onto the ends of the branch. Now this tree was a special tree. Some people say that when Krishna touched the tree, the tree came back to life. Others in Agarga Samhita says that actually Garuda knew that Krishna would do take this action in the future. So he poured some nectar on this tree and the tree was alive. So you see even the Acharyas, they differ. Some say it's like this, some say that. Krishna's pastimes are really a mystery. But anyway, Krishna got up and he was flapping his arms like a wrestler and he jumped high in the air. <laughs> splash into the river. And the river just flowed and it overflowed its banks and Krishna was just swimming around, having a good time. Kaliya said, what's going on? Somebody's in my lake. This is a disturbance. And he came and he saw this beautiful boy. Kaliya has a hundred heads. That means he's got 200 eyes. And he was looking. He's beautiful, but still, he's messing up my lake. <laughs> so Kaliya came and captured Krishna in his coils. And Krishna was wrapped in the coils of Kaliya. Now the cowherd boys saw this and then they ran to tell the residents of Vrindavan what happened. But at the same time, as soon as this happened, the whole area changed. Meteors started flying out of the sky and the whole atmosphere became very what we say, ill omens started to pervade everywhere. 
It was a very unhappy feeling. Mother Yasoda, Nanda Maharaj, and all the cowherd boys and cow and the girls, they came. They wanted to find Krishna. Where's Krishna? Krishna's never around. He's not here. We can't find him. So they started to look, and on the ground they found his footprints. And Krishna has these nice footprints. On the bottom of his feet, he's got all auspicious. He's got the gold, he's got a chakra, he's got various types of insignias, lightning bolt, bali corn, castles, beautiful. Krishna has how many? 20, 32? Shankar, Pandit, how many, how many imprints does Krishna have on his bottom of his feet? 32, yeah, that's what I thought. 32. And therefore, they followed the footprints and they led right to the Jamuna. Balaram, he understood the whole situation and he was just relaxed. He wasn't going to, he was just watching the whole thing. But the residents of Vrindavan, Krishna is our life. Krishna is our life of our life. Without Krishna, there's no life. We don't even want to exist if there's no Krishna. Krishna Mata, Krishna Pita, Krishna Dot, Krishna is everything. Krishna is, even when we don't see Krishna, we're not happy. So they cannot stop thinking of Krishna, they cannot stop loving Krishna, they can't stop serving Krishna. So, and then when Mother Yasoda saw Krishna and wrapped in the coils of this hideous snake, she was stunned in fear. And she started to run towards the Jamuna to jump in and try to help. But Balaram stopped her. <laughs> and then Nanda Maharaj, he wanted to go. And Balaram stopped him too. So everyone was stuck. They were watching Krishna. And then the cowherd, everyone was lamenting, oh, Krishna, he's caught in this hideous snake. What will happen? And then Krishna, Realizing that the distress, now Krishna put his devotees into distress. Why does he do that? Why does he, his devotees know nothing but him? And they cannot think of him. What is their fault? No fault at all. He wants to bring out their love. He wants to bring out their love. And so their love was being shown in, by the anxiety they were feeling for Krishna. So then Krishna said, oh, okay, I guess the anxiety has reached a certain level. So then he just <laughs> broke out of the coils. And then he started to do a little theatrical performance. He was dancing. So he decided to dance on the hoods of Kaliya. And Kaliya has a hundred hoods. So he was jumping from one hood to another and just trying out some new dance steps. And then the, the gopis were watching and Krishna was thinking, hmm, this is nice. The gopis are watching me dance. Mm, so I'll show off even bit more. It says that boys like to show off in front of girls, right? This is normal. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> so boys like to show off in front. So Krishna's got that propensity. He wants to just... So he's dancing. And, he, and when Kaliya tries to grab him with one hood, he dances on another one. He jumps from this way to that. And Kaliya can't. And Krishna is just dancing. But his dancing is not like a sweet caress of the head of Kali. It's like a thunderbolt hitting his head. Everyone, boom! And it's boom. He's just like falling this way and that way. And he tries to capture Krishna. With him. Krishna dumps and he's smiling. And he's doing all kinds of, you know... And special dance steps, <laughs> none, some that they never really saw before. He just comes up with his new steps. <laughs> he's fast too, and he's dancing. And so this is happening. And Kali is Kali is getting weaker and weaker, trying to capture Krishna and crush him, but he can't do it. And finally, he's getting weaker, and then all of a sudden, his poison, which is full in his body, is starting to come out, and he's exuding, exhaling all these nasty fumes, and they're all coming out, but there he's getting purified, and Chris is just having a good time dancing. <laughs> and it's going on and on and on and on and on and on. 
And finally, at one point, he's got no energy left and he's still trying to capture Krishna. And this time he's vomiting blood. <laughs> it's getting really gory now. <laughs> and all this blood is coming out with the fumes. And then Kalia somehow had a good fortune. He had these nice wives called the, the Nagapatnis. And so they came and said, dear Lord, he's our husband. <laughs> Please, uh, he, no, we know he's a rascal. <laughs> he's, an, he's an envious person, but still he's our husband. <laughs> it's called love. <laughs> and so they're, you know, pleading with Krishna. And Krishna, just by the sweet prayers, and they offered beautiful prayers to Krishna. Krishna decided, decided to give him some relief. And then Kaliya, he didn't kill Kakalia, he just beat him down. But he left a nice imprint on his head and he told Kaliya, after Kaliya realized that this person who's doing this, he must be God. <laughs> Nobody else can, can, can take care of me in this way. So finally he offered some prayers and Krishna told him, okay, you can't stay here, you have to go. You have to go. You're not allowed to stay in Vrindavan. But he said, where am I going to go? Garuda's always after me. <laughs> Krishna said, don't worry, my footprints are on your head. And when Garuda sees that, he'll let you alone. So you can go peacefully. So what does this particular pastime mean? The residents of Vrindavan are innocent. And they open their hearts to every, anybody sometimes. Sometimes when a person is very innocent in nature, they don't suspect something evil from others because they don't have that tendency in themselves. They see other people in the same way they are. Atmanam Vandyate Jagat. One sees a person according to how one is themselves. One projects. But because of their innocence, they were polluted, apparently polluted by the poison. So what does this indicate? That sometimes unscrupulous persons try to pollute the minds of the devotees against devotional service and teach them wrong principles or teach them philosophical things that are way beyond their normal practice of devotional service in order to gain followers or just to destroy another person's bhakti. Krishna allows that to go on up to a certain point and then he comes in and then he rectifies the situation and then the devotees see that they take shelter of Krishna and then Krishna destroys that tendency so this particular pastime, and Bhakti, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati gives a commentary on this, and he says something really amazing at the end of the commentary. It's published in The Harmonist. And he says, the mercy shown to Kaliya is so obviously and disproportionately great in its magnitude in face of the extreme gravity of Kaliya's offense that no rationalistic explanation can do justice to the full beneficent significance. In other words, what Krishna showed him was way beyond what he deserved in terms of the mercy. He tried to pollute the residents of Vrindavan, but still he got the mercy of the Lord. Amazing, amazing, amazing. That's Krishna. Now Krishna, he's, Tough as it, stronger than the thunderbolt, but he's also softer than a rose. So that's his discretion. So the mercy he was shown. So this particular pastime uh, means that one who takes shelter and hears this particular pastime will be free from the tendency of maliciousness, enviousness, and cruelty. Well, these pastimes are actually very 
what we say, deep in philosophical meanings along with the actual leelas that play out Krishna's leelas, pastimes, very deep in philosophical meanings. So therefore, we should hear these pastimes. Simply by hearing Krishna's pastimes, especially his killing of the demons, there's a class of people that like to hear Krishna's pastimes with his devotees in a sweet way. The pastimes of the gopis and Krishna and Vrindavan, the Rasa Leela, and similar Leelas. But they avoid the demon killing pastimes. But the Acharyas explain that all of these pastimes are equally transcendental. And therefore, one who hears these pastimes will also become transcendental, although it's about killing demons. <laughs> these demons are actual factual representations, and at the same time, they are, they also teach us, Krishna teaches us through killing these demons, how to destroy sinful and what we say irreligious tendencies like that. So this is about that. So I spoke about